Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Singer and songwriter Otis Redding wrote a fairly famous song in 1965. And that was not as big a hit for him as Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, but it was a pretty big hit for him. Um, it was a plea, this song I'm talking about, uh, it was like a, a man talking to the woman in his life, uh, urging her to please give him some honor for the way that he goes about working providing for the family, um, the effort that goes into that uh, each time. And so that was the song. And it, it climbed the record charts and became a crossover hit. It ended up number four on the R&B charts. In 1967, it got a reboot by Aretha Franklin. The Queen of Soul flipped it. It still is, uh, this is still in an era of the civil rights movement. Uh, it's also in an era when women are really starting to seek empowerment, uh, more so than maybe in the past. Equal pay, uh, credit that wasn't tied to the husband, um, other economic markers in society at that time. And so she turned the song that Otis Redding wrote called Respect and turned it into an anthem for women's empowerment. Uh, it won for best R&B recording and top solo vocal performance in 1967. It was number one on Billboard's top 100 charts for two weeks, and in fact it was Aretha's first number one hit. And it had this iconic ending to it. <laughs> R-E-S-P-E-C-T. She spelled it out. That was not in Otis Redding's version, by the way. She added that. Um, and it was a rallying cry for equal rights. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Not just for women, but African Americans in the Civil Rights Movement adopted that song as well. And it's one of the most easily identifiable songs in American music history. If you hear that come on the radio, you know immediately what it is. So a small tangent here. We're obviously talking about respect today. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And so I got to thinking, okay, I've provided a definition for you each week of what do these words actually mean according to the dictionary. This time I thought, well, you know what, I've been playing around with artificial intelligence, AI, uh, specifically chat GPT, which I got to tell you, if you haven't tried this, folks, sometimes it's better than Google. <laughs> Especially if you're just trying to find like illustrations or examples of something, you can type something in there and it gives you uh, a pretty good listing of things. And I thought, well, just for kicks, let's type this in to chat GPT and see what it tells us. So I asked a very simple question. What does it mean to respect someone? This is just a screenshot from my computer. And this is the answer that it gave. Don't worry, I know it's small type, I'm gonna read it to you. But here's the answer that it gave. Respect means recognizing and valuing another person's dignity, opinions, rights, and boundaries. It involves treating them with kindness, consideration, and fairness, regardless of their background, beliefs, or actions. Respect can take many forms, such as listening attentively, being open to their viewpoints even if you disagree, acknowledging their worth, showing appreciation for their qualities, efforts, or experiences, being considerate, avoiding behaviors that might harm or belittle them, and honoring their boundaries, respecting their personal space, choices, and feelings. And then there's a sentence at the bottom of that bulleted list that really hit me. In essence, respect is about treating others the way you'd want to be treated, creating mutual understanding and trust. Treating others the way you want to be treated, 
Where have I heard that before? <laughs> It'd be kind of creepy getting this kind of thing from an artificial intelligence type of thing if it wasn't so blatantly and overtly true to what we're seeking as Christians in the world today. And of course, ChatGPT's answer fits amazingly well into our Do Unto Others sermon series that we're talking about here. Um, we're moving closer and closer and closer to that November 5th election date, right? And have you noticed the commercials have gotten worse and worse and worse? Um, I have to admit, I'm kind of shielded in Topeka. We don't have the Kansas City area commercials, and so we don't see that you guys get double dipped here. You get the Kansas side and the Missouri side and all the, all the rigmarole that goes with that. Um, the whole purpose behind this Do Unto Other Sermon Series is to help us understand that we can't control anybody else. We can't control the politicians, their ardent, most ardent of supporters. All we can do is worry about us. What can we control? And as I've encouraged you throughout this series, what I'm hoping for is a grassroots effort of kindness, of compassion, of humility. And today we're going to add a fourth word to it, respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Which is something that we're kind of lacking, unfortunately, in our world today. Um, if you really pay attention to what's going on, you notice that, holy cow, there's more name-calling by adults seeking political leadership positions than we would ever allow on the playground of an elementary school. <laughs> and yet, there they are. Um, we're talking about folks who discount opponents' talents and or their intelligence. Uh, just like we're on the playground, I had flashbacks of Howard Wilson School, third grade, with some of the guys that were in that class with me. The reality is those folks and their supporters, it doesn't matter what side you have, honestly, we could find examples on, on both ends of this, uh, but they don't listen attentively at all. They certainly aren't acknowledging the worth of other people. They are not considerate in the least, and they're not honoring another's feelings. Like Aretha should be demanding, or, or saying we should be demanding, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. But one of the things that she said in that song that I'd never paid attention to, to be totally honest with you, after she gets done with R-E-S-P-C-T, she says, take care of T-C-B. I had no idea what that meant. I had to look it up. And it turns out that T-C-B means take care of business. In other words, R-E-S-P-C-T, do something about it. Take care of business. Um, she borrowed that, actually. Elvis Presley was, I guess, famously known for, in his business dealings, telling people when he would sign documents or enter into some kind of contract, let's TCB, let's take care of business. Um, if you're not familiar enough with that, or that seems a bit dated, then we can go with a little more modern vernacular, Larry the Cable Guy, get her done. Same thing get things done. Uh, we heard a little earlier it, when Ollie read you the New Testament lesson uh, from 1 Corinthians uh, how exactly we're supposed to TCB or get her done. And it's by virtue of using the gifts that God has given us, the spiritual gifts that each one of us possesses. Uh, the reality is, folks, we are all given spiritual gifts. You may not think you have them, but I promise you, you have at least one, and my guess is you've got two, three, four, or more. Let's go through the little list that Ollie read for you a little earlier. This is from the letter um, to, from Paul to the church in Corinth, uh, which was having all sorts of problems. And he's trying to help them clarify, clarify a few things. Here's the list that, that we went through a few minutes ago. Wisdom, which is like intelligence. Knowledge, which means knowing things. Faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, identifying spirits, speaking in tongues, and then being able to identify what somebody just said in tongues. 
I had a really smart pastor that told me one time, you know, people can say gibberish and say they're speaking in tongues, but here's the reality. If somebody's speaking in tongues in your presence, there's going to be somebody else in the room that can tell you what was actually said, or else it's a, just a bogus thing. That was one of the things that he pointed out, and that makes a lot of sense to me. But what does it all mean? Paul gives a little bit further instruction or description as he continues. So we're going to pick up today right where Ollie left off. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he read through verse 11. We're going to pick up at verse 12 and go through 27. Here's what this says. Christ is just like the human body. A body is a unit and has many parts. And all the parts of the body are one body, even though there are many. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek or slave or free, and we all were given one spirit to drink. Certainly the body isn't one part but many. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean I'm not part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, what would happen to the hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed each one of the parts in the body just like he wanted. If all were one and the same body part, what would happen to the body? But as, as, as it is, there are many parts but one body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. The parts of the body that we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. The private parts of our body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor so that there won't be division in the body and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. You are the body of Christ and parts with each other. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. In other words, we are all part of one body, the body of Christ, the church. And every one of them, you know, those pieces is important. The ones we can't even see, such as our internal organs, turns out are the most important of all. And notice how God ordered them in verses 24 and 25. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor so that there won't be any division in the body and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. He was, Paul rattled off a few things that seemed kind of nonsensical out of context of the era. He, he says, you know, well, if, if the ear says that, you know, I'm not the eye, so I'm not as important, that's the same as us saying, well, I don't have this spiritual gift, so I'm not that important. That's not true. We were all given gifts because we are all supposed to use them in ministry in some way, shape, or form. So each part of the body of Christ is supposed to do what, based on what we just read? Respect each other. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. It doesn't call for us to, give the, to fall into the petty divisions that we've managed to do to ourselves. Um... We're not supposed to allow them to fester or create a large impasse. As the body of Christ, we are supposed to be together, working together, even though we are different. We are one. And unfortunately, folks, the church leads the way in not being very good at this. Think about it. It started with Jesus with 12 people. And it explodes. If you read the book of Acts, it grows and grows and grows. But how many churches are there? How many denominations are there? By the way, it's tens of thousands. And that means that there's been tens of thousands of fractures of times that we allowed ourselves to get bogged down and caught in the world's way of being petty with things, not respecting one another. But I'm here to tell you, it can be done. I have two examples from the church that my wife and I served in Utah that I'm going to share with you today. One that we had a direct role in and one that we were just along for the ride. But they show, I think, the idea of respect with people that, okay, you agree a little bit, 
but not completely with. Here are a couple of examples. The first one is called Backpacks for Kids. I'm proud to say that this one started at Shepherd of the Hills United Methodist Church. Now, for those of you who haven't heard my story before, Shepherd of the Hills was the only United Methodist Church in the southwest corner of the state. It was 322 miles from our parking lot to Hilltop United Methodist Church, which was the closest one to us in the south end of the Salt Lake City Valley. That's a four and a half hour drive, for those of you doing the math, between United Methodist Churches. So we were the little outpost on the far corner of the state. And we wanted to provide backpacks for kids because we knew that there was a problem. You see, we lived in the county with the lowest per pupil spending in public schools in the state of Utah. And Utah was the lowest per pupil spending state in the nation. We would have had to have spent an astronomical amount of money to catch Mississippi. <laughs> we were the worst. And the reason we were the worst is the culture. It wasn't because people didn't want to spend money on education. It was just the reality. Two factors. Number one, we lived in a community that was 80% Mormon. Large families. Lots of children. My best illustration of that is we, did a, we had a great neighborhood that we lived in. Uh, one day we just decided on a whim, I think Saturday morning some of us guys were out in the yard, or maybe it was the women, it was probably the women, uh, were out talking about it and said, hey, we should do like a block dinner tonight. So all of us wheeled our grills out to the cul-de-sac. One of us did chicken, one of us did steaks, one of us did burgers, one of us did like baked potatoes and corn. It was great. But while we're sitting there eating with this group of people, our friends, uh, we got to thinking, there are eight houses on this cul-de-sac, this street with the cul-de-sac. How many kids under the age of 18 do we have here? The answer was 32. My wife and I had two of them, which meant for the other seven houses, there were 30 children under the age of 18. That's one block, but it illustrates the challenge. The second challenge was Utah is 80% public land. Between the Bureau of Land Management, the National Forest Service, a couple of other uh, government entities, 80% public land. That means that 80% can't be used for taxation. So the property taxes come from this really small, these really small pockets. That means your schools can't get funded very well. All that to tell you is we had a problem. We had a lot of kids that their parents could not buy them pencils. They could not buy them scissors. When they got older, they sure as heck could not buy them calculators. And the specific notebooks that the teachers felt would be best for them. We just knew that they couldn't do it. So we wanted to help provide that. Small church, we're probably about 170 in worship at this time. Uh, maybe not quite that far, but we're, we're getting into that number. And so we decided, okay, let's try this. We raised enough funds and we went out and got donations enough that we were able to fill 70 backpacks the first year. We were ecstatic. We didn't put a dent in the problem, but we got 70 backpacks together. It was pretty amazing. That was 2004. I actually had to go back and look it up. I couldn't remember when we started this, but 2004. You know what, within five years, we were filling 700 backpacks every year. Um, and the reason that we were able to do that was because our little congregation, which at that time was 225, 250, something like that. I say little because it was a huge land area that we covered. Um, we, didn't dis we decided we can't do this on our own. So we invited other churches to come along with us. The local Rotary Club heard about what we were doing and they got involved. And yes, we invited the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in our area, the Mormon Church, to join us. We don't agree hardly on anything related to theology. We agree that there's a guy named Jesus that's the Savior for the world, and that's about the beginning and the end of it. But I will tell you this, those folks got together with us and we did some amazing things. 700 backpacks. We would assemble those things in 30 minutes. We had so many people, and we had, we had a, a, a way of doing like an assembly line where people would pick up the backpack and they would just go to the next person, they'd drop their stuff in, you take it, you zip it up, you put it in the corner, you got back in line. And we did that. Uh, we did that year after year after year. 
And I remember that we took a little criticism. Actually, I shouldn't say we. Buddy Harrington, the pastor, the lead pastor, who is my wife's mentor. That's him on the far right with her up there. Um, Buddy was chastised by some of the members of our congregation because he invited the Mormons to be involved with us. And I still remember Buddy's response. I can't quote it, but it was basically this. We can worry about the things we disagree about, or we can focus on the things that we do agree on. And I think we can all agree that children deserve a chance to learn. And if we can't get behind that, we maybe need to reread the scriptures. Buddy was very adamant about that. And as a result, that was a very small group of people in our church, and it stopped immediately. And every year it grew and grew and grew. It grew to the point where the church no longer is responsible for this. They have people who are serving on it. They have, probably have 100 people every year that help with it at some point. But it now is its own 501c3 organization. It was getting close to that by the time Amy and I left, but it wasn't quite there yet. But they've since done this. And so... Um, it's just an incredible story about how getting people involved, showing respect for others, you can make, it is interesting, all the words come together in this series, respect for others leads to acts of compassion for people who need it. That was one that we had a direct tie into. There's another one that we were just kind of along for the ride, and it was an amazing ride. I want to introduce you to Father Gustavo Vidal. Father Vidal came about, um, let's say 2005, 2006, to the St. George, Utah area. He became the priest at St. George Catholic Church. Father Vidal inherited a church that frankly did not do anything other than within their own group. And the reason for that's pretty simple, actually. If think about it, the desert southwest, largely Hispanic population in that church, large enough percentage of the membership was Hispanic. They had been hurt so many times by the people in that community. Made fun of, ridiculed, uh, asking if they had their papers. Just ridiculous stuff. But Father Vidal was one of the most even-keeled, calm men I think I've ever had the privilege of getting to know. The one thing that the Catholic Church did do with the rest of us in that era was they were the host for the ecumenical Boy Scout and Cub Scout troops. I was the Cub Master. Uh, and so we met in the Fellowship Hall of St. George Catholic Church. That was our place to meet uh, when we had our PAC meetings. And then the Boy Scouts met at the Knights of Columbus. And so that was, that was the entirety of what St. George Catholic Church used to do outside the walls. But that changed under Father Vidal because Father Vidal knew that he needed to show respect to the community, and by virtue of that, the respect, the, the respect just bled through the community. Here's what Father Vidal did. He went to the Interfaith Council of Pastors, and he said, I want to have a celebration on Good Friday. I want to invite all of you to take part in a Stations of the Cross celebration with us. St. George, like every other Utah community, was built on a grid system, which meant that every street runs exactly north-south or exactly east-west and they're all numbered. So there is no such thing as an Elm Street or Main Street or anything like that. My address, the last one we lived at, was 2496 South 2310 East Circle. Now that sounds confusing, but once you get it through your head, you know that it's a grid. You can never get lost because you know what the address of everything is. You can figure out where is that on this grid. But there's one street that that didn't work for. Along the bluff, to, to connect Bluff Street Park on the north end of the town to the beginnings of the downtown, which happened to be where St. George Catholic Church's parking lot rested, was a street that was called Diagonal Street. <laughs> Not very original, but that was the name of the street, and it's because it ran diagonal to everything else. Father Vidal invited the United Methodist Church to be part of that. He invited Baptists to be part of that. He invited the non-denominational church there in town to be part of that. I think that might actually be the only church that turned him down. And he invited the LDS church, the leadership of the Mormon church in that community to take part. So it started off with about 100 people the first year. 
But we were excited. We had been invited. We took part. That street now, every year, they close it down. And if I remember right, last year they said they had almost 2,000 people walk Bluff Street. And what they did was they just kept, kept the same formula. They started in Bluff Street and they worked their way toward the Catholic Church. Every stop is one of the, the stations of the cross. Somebody stops, a different church is responsible for reading the scripture, for saying a prayer, and then the next station picks up the cross, carries it to theirs, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat until you get to the Catholic Church, and, and the, the priest there usually does the last, the last one. Uh, amazing opportunity to show respect to one another. And it started with Father Vidal. He's no longer there. Uh, I think it's a testament that in the, both of these examples, the people who started it are no longer there, and it continues to grow because respect has been shown to others. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, taking care of TCB, or get her done. Remember that we have the opportunities to get things done. Our job description as Christians, I've shown this to you several times before, it's really simple. Jesus took 613 laws in the first five books of the Bible and boiled it down to three. Love God, love others, make disciples. That's it. It's a lot easier to keep track of three, isn't it, than 613. But to do those last two, the first one's all on us, loving God. The that last two require us to do action for other people to show respect to each of them. And we do that by using our spiritual gifts and our graces. Because whether we like it or not or acknowledge it or not, we are all on the same team. We just all have different roles to play on that team. That's what the spiritual gifts are for. Folks, there's a reason the Royals don't go out on the, on the nine positions with nine people who can play catcher. Because you've got to have somebody that can chase the ball down in the outfield, and you've got to have somebody at shortstop that can get the ball across the diamond. As much as we love Travis Kelsey, there's a reason the Chiefs don't go out there with the starting 11 that are all really tight ends. That wouldn't work. If you don't agree with those examples, then how about this? Bill Self is not going to send five six-foot point guards out to start a game. That would be not a good idea. We could handle the ball, but we wouldn't be able to do much of anything else. We are all on a team, and we all have a role to play. The problem we have in our political climate today is that others don't acknowledge that others are on the team. We have to be the ones to point that out to them. Our job is to show respect and love to other people. So in closing, what can you do? Let's go back to the, G, the chat GPT thing, because this is really simple. There's just those four bullet points. Um, I'm going to ask you to think about these four questions each time that you are wondering, okay, somebody just said something I really don't agree with. Am I going to fly off the handle at them, or am I going to show respect? Here are the questions you should ask yourself. And they go back to that chat GPT uh, item that I showed you earlier. Just ask yourself, am I listening attentively so I can understand their viewpoint? Am I acknowledging the worth of this person? and not just discounting them because I know I disagree with them? Am I being considerate? And am I honoring this person's feelings? That's on us. Those are the things we can handle, we can control. In other words, are you showing them R-E-S-P-E-C-T? Let's pray. Loving God, you created all of us You've given each of us tools to do the job you intend for us to do here on this earth, which is to usher in your kingdom. But too often, we don't show respect to others. Father God, please grant us wisdom to see when others are not showing respect and allow us to see in ourselves when we need to improve on showing respect to others. Help us to get the job done, living as Christ showed us, not by putting ourselves on pedestals, but by realizing that all are equal in your eyes. Help us to see that clearly as this election day draws ever nearer. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen.